<laughs> hey everybody, I'm Lex. I'm Alex. That's Lex with an A. Yeah. All right, hey, we're talking uh, hygiene. Hygiene, security hygiene. Yeah, appreciate you using the soap. You're welcome. Hey, before we get started, guys, we are looking for an awesome C Sharp developer. So please, if you're awesome or you know someone who's awesome, apply. Hit us uh, about us and uh, look for careers on our website. So with that, should we uh, let's jump dig, into let's hygiene? Let's dig right in. Yeah. All right. Sounds so. good. So, what do we want to talk about today is with regards to hygiene. So we have. Uh, <laughs> I just every time you say yeah. that, I'm gonna start laughing, man. He's just gonna laugh. I, I got so many jokes. We've got inventory and deploy, which mm -hmm. are huge tools to helping us become better at our hygiene. At our hygiene. Our, I, I thought our security. Soap in a shower. Would our do security. That, but... Okay, so hygiene. Basically, guys, you know, uh, if you look at it, right, there are so many different ways to get in and mess up your networks and your, uh, you know, harmonious uh, ITness. It, <laughs> that's a new word. Use I like it. it. Use I like it, it in your everyday conversations. Okay, but um, the biggest thing. Okay, a couple things, right? The biggest thing that we find across the board when you look up things is make sure that you are patched. Patched. Okay. And he should know because he's the most patched man. The most. Yeah, that's 49 seconds of your life you might want back if you watch <laughs> that one. But, and again, guys, I'm just going to pop this up really quick. If you go to inventory, obviously we've got our collection libraries. You'll notice I'm going to look at you because you guys are the ones. We got uh, yeah. 23 machines that have old Chrome, 29 that have got old Firefox, and I bet you money we've got, yep. Couple oh, machines that have got some. These are, now see these are these are for testing purposes, all right? This is a lab. This is for our test testing. environment. This is not production. And Please don't practice this in production. So, and the other thing we did so that we could show you guys, uh, I'm going to show you how to build a report that just pulls all the machines that are part of a uh, collection that has the word old in it. So we're going to do a basic report. We'll do a computer name. We will do member of collection. And then the filter is going to be pretty simple, guys. I'm just going to add a filter for the member of collection. Name contains the word old. Okay. And so here's a really quick. We just type in old because I am the spelling champ. You can't do it. But you run this guy. And now we will have, I should probably, oh, no. We got the all computers collection. Excellent. So. Here's the machines and every machine that is part of an old collection. So apparently in our lab, we need some work to do to get things patched, okay? Again, guys, the reason software gets updated is to close the, the, the holes in yeah. it, you know, as exploits come up, you know, they're gonna patch them and do that. So guys, get your patching done. Inventory can definitely help you get that going on. So. <clears throat> Well, that and with deploy, it makes it so much easier. So Absolutely. that you don't have to figure out how am I supposed to update all of my machines in my network. That's kind of the whole premise of what inventory and deploy is all about. Yeah. So that's what helps with with security, along with just being annoying that you're all out of date and you want it updated. <laughs> so you are a security guy, right? I mean, obviously Alex is our, our security guy. And so what got you into security, man? So when I was younger, I um, was getting uh, I was looking for an Xbox. Okay. Was, you know, that was the cool thing when you were younger, back when the first the first edition came out, and there was this web page that had this modified Xbox. It was all white. You could do all this cool stuff with it. And I was like, I want to buy that. And so I went online. I purchased it through PayPal. So I'm thinking, oh, you know, PayPal is secure. Uh, purchased it, waited my two to six weeks of time, waiting for my package to arrive. Never came. So you get you know. stiffed. So no I'm, Xbox. I'm, yeah. And they ripped you off. <laughs> yeah. I, so I called uh, PayPal. And I said, hey, I never got my product. And they're like, we'll do some investigating for you. And they're like, here's how much we recovered. It was like $20 or some s really small amount. Mm. And come to find out the web page no longer exists. It was basically a scam. They were never going to send it to me in the first place. And from then on, I've learned my lesson of being scammed from, from fake web pages or just <clears throat> things of that nature. So that's kind of where I can pinpoint a point in time where I start looking into security. Okay. Well, all right. So you have a reason for this. Yeah. So, okay. Perfect Patches. <laughs> <laughs> you have a reason. Yeah. <laughs> Captain Obvious. All right. This <laughs> derailed my train, guys. Thanks. <clears throat> so another thing that helps security passwords. Right. Passwords. Okay. Huge. That's a huge vulnerability. Uh, weak passwords. 
Um, now, you were telling me you, you did a whole, like, 40-minute thing on passwords alone, but yep. a couple things. Let's just, we'll touch quick on passwords. One, uh, make them difficult, right? Well, define difficult, I guess. But, All right. But that's that's for a different day, but yes. The other thing Complex. is... Uh, Complexity. <clears throat> You know, LAPS, like local admin passwords. We do work with LAPS, guys. LAPS is amazing because of? Because you don't have the same password for all of your machines, the the admin password on all your, your machines. So what that would help do is if somebody were to compromise the local admin password on one machine, they, they can't just plug that same password into all of your machines and be done, basically own your network. So that's one of the many solutions that you can use that we offer uh, support with. We do integrate with Labs. We integrate with, yes, that is a Microsoft uh, solution, but we do integrate it with it. Uh, and if you can use it, and if you know how, we do have great knowledge base uh, articles on those. Go look those videos up, but that would be something I would recommend doing if you can do it. So now, um, the other thing is, uh, because of when I do this, I keep fairly complex passwords. Uh, I can't remember all of them. You know, heaven forbid, you know, I drink away one of my passwords <laughs> and things are, you know. So I use KeePass, guys, and, and obviously you can get KeePass from our uh, collection library, or excuse me, package library, Correct. and deploy it. But again, just don't forget the main password. You forget that one, you're messed. So, so you have, yeah, the master password, that's the one you don't want to forget, and that's the one you want to make as most difficult so to remember. Well, not su- remember, but difficult. To my suggestion is put it on a post-it and right stick it. Right under your keyboard. Right, yeah, yep. yeah, okay. That's what, you do that too? Is that? I thought it was. I thought that was best practice. Yeah, don't do that. Don't. Let's take a question. Dear Lex and Alex, do you recommend the PDQ credential account be a domain admin? We use a PDQ service account currently. Sincerely, Kyle Loren B. Kyle, may the force be with you. Thanks, Kyle. All right. Um, (laughs) 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 You leave it to me to a really bad joke in there. There you go. Yeah. But uh, okay, so here's the thing. I have no issue with it being a domain admin. The, the big thing, once again, is you know make sure you got like a password, you know, policy on that, a decently difficult password, and then it cycles. Yes. And just make sure when it cycles, you change it and deploy an inventory. Otherwise, it's gonna start complaining, and you're gonna have all sorts of fun. You end up locking that account out. Exactly. So yeah, I, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Agreed. Again, laps again. Consider it if you can. So. Hey, Lex. Yeah. Got a curveball here. Uh oh, here it goes. I, <clears throat> Prepare for the crash and burn, well, guys. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I want to talk about. I want to talk about kind of an elephant in the room that I think a lot of a lot of our, our customers certainly have had to deal with, mm. and I know you have had to deal with this. <laughs> and that is customers or uh, end users that legitimately need to have local administrator rights, and their name is Lynn. Oh. Ah. Uh, yeah, okay. So, and yeah. unless I did not give the name of the company. Company or the last I, name of the guy. I just knew that guy. that word would throw you in there. So, you, you, how did you deal with it? Because there are people who say, okay, I'm not allowing my end users to have it, but sometimes they legitimately need it. Occasionally, you get that piece of software that, you know, needs to be written a little bit better, right? That's the way I would say it. User has to have a local admin. So what I did, <laughs> I used PDQ Deploy and Inventory. And what i do is I would run a report on his machine every day and figure out everything he was doing. And I'd make an automatic uninstall. So every time he rebooted, that thing would just uninstall <laughs> everything that guy did. And then I told him I was recording every keystroke he was doing. Now that was good and bad. It lasted about a week. And then he figured out I really wasn't. But the let uninstall. The re- let the record show. He- you weren't recording it with PDQ since we don't have a key. No, that's logger. true. It was <laughs> well, I couldn't. I didn't have a logger on there anyways. It was and just I know, a lie. I know, but I, I know that you had spoken with you. You were a consultant there, and you had yeah. spoken with management, and they had said he has a legitimate need for it. And yet, this this guy downloaded so many viruses onto his system, and yeah, their email, their email, their email. Got, uh, he compromised so, so many things. Yeah, marked for spam. And uh, you know you can't you can't solve a political problem with technology, but you can somewhat mitigate it. So yeah, I just that wanted to throw true. that down there. We know people, you do have some of these problems, and maybe you guys can t- talk a little bit about ways to mitigate it. I think a lot of it comes down to user education. Explain to them the reasons why 
you don't want them to have administrative you know, privileges. I think most people that works for this guy in particular. Okay, true. Not, it, not, then not that's so not a, that's not a cookie cutter solution, but it's a good start to yeah. helping others understand that you're not just trying to be a control freak. Freak, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, but you're trying to help them understand that installing and downloading anything and everything from wherever you want is not okay. The other thing I was about to do was deep freeze his machine and then mm -hmm. force a reboot on it midday. That's not a bad. So you know. Yeah, you have those special. Special you, people. Yeah. Those special people. Special that people. You need yeah. to yeah. apply it's, special it's, solutions to. You may as well do a plug for deep freeze in those yeah. in those cases, folks. You might want to look at uh, exactly at Phronix deep freeze. Yeah. It's um, it's meant. It may as well be called deep freeze lin. It's yeah, meant, no it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, meant, it's meant for those, and I and I will say for those of you who really want closure, one of the happiest moments of my life is as Lex still is friends with some of the people there is when Lex came up. <laughs> I'm dancing here and, and just said, I just found out that it they was one virus him. too many, and he was uh, he was shown the door. Yes, <laughs> it was, I, I did. You know, you've you seen the dance I do before. This was the happy dance, which is a little bit different. But you think Lynn will ever watch this? You know who you are, Lynn. I'm talking about you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So, well, on that note. Uh, okay, let's talk about firewalls. So firewalls. Yeah, firewalls. Speaking of letting people out you. the door and blocking people from leaving the door, yeah. we have uh, something to talk about, firewalls. So we have two different versions of firewalls that we focus on. We've got hardware firewalls and software-defined firewalls. Now, your software-defined firewall would be something like in Windows. We have uh, here on the screen is... Wind the Windows firewall. Mm -hmm. And what you'll do with that is you can use this tool to allow applications or specific ports to be um, allowed to connect or into your system that you trust. So let's say I wanted to allow port 909099. Yep. Because that's what I'm running, but that's not a common port. Okay, basically. I'm going to allow the connection. Yep. Okay. We're going to allow the rule. And where do you want that to apply to? So if you're a domain joined computer, then allow it there. If you're not, then you can. So is there you a, can tweak that? Is there a danger in allowing it publicly? Just opening ninety nine ninety nine out to the public. That well, this is mostly determined uh, if you're joined to a network that you click, and when you join a new network, mm -hmm. Windows says, "Hey, what kind of network is this? Is this public? Is this private? Or is this a domain network?" If you go to like a coffee shop and you say, "I'm joined to a public network," then you probably don't want that. Port open. Port open to the public. So yes, you would probably uncheck that for the public side. Now another thing I want to bring up. Okay, so I made ninety 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 nine, and I opened it up. Now the nice thing is, this is internal, and, and Alex will talk about the external firewall. Okay, um, is you're going to scope this, right? So let's say I did have to open this up. To scope it means yeah. I'm going to minimize the footprint that's that is going to be exposed to. So this port is only allowed to, let's say, one nine two dot. 168.0.0 and we'll say a slash 24 so it's only open to a uh, RF1918 space network which should be internal yeah. yep okay so now I've just excluded anybody outside that now that works for that yes but you know again every time you can minimize the exposure the more secure you're going to be correct okay correct so I'm gonna save that by hitting cancel because I really don't want that. So I'm gonna <laughs> hit delete here. Cancel to delete that rule. All right. So that's that. Now, uh, when you think of firewalls, guys, I, I like to think of it as like okay, you know, it's simple. You've got the chicken coop, right? You want to keep the fox out of the chicken coop, right? Bark, so, bark. as Brig might say, bark, bark. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what Brig likes. <laughs> that's exactly what he would say. That's exactly okay. So you got the chicken coop, right? Now you want to keep the fox out of the chicken coop. Once the fox is in the chicken coop, he's got access to all the chickens. So potentially, yes. The big deal: keep the fox out, right? So yeah. that's where. So the, that's where the fire, the uh, hardware firewall, which would typically sit at the point where your internet connection comes into your network. So the firewall is the first line of defense that comes in, and then it hopefully protects the rest of the devices in your network. But as we learned with the Lin story, that's not always the case because yeah. users can still download and do things that will mitigate the firewall usage. However, if you were wanting to connect to something internally, uh, I recomm highly recommend using a VPN solution so that you can allow those chickens to come in and out of that gate without ever having to worry about that fox also coming in with him. So basically you're giving a, yeah. you know, a key to get in. Yep. to the locked door exactly so you could also scope a specific ip like if i had a static ip at my my house mm -hmm. we could put a we could scope that if, if you wanted to do that way or 
But that that would minimize the connection, but does it encrypt the, the connection between the two? No, it does not. Okay, so that's also that's they can get the encryption encrypted connection put together. Speaking about firewalls and ports and stuff, where do I go? What's a good place to go check to see what are the most exploited ports? There's actually a great resource for that. If you've ever heard of the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, which Geek Alert, probably not. Nerd Alert. Uh, Nerd Alert is Verizon re releases a report they do annually uh, collecting data from companies worldwide. And can you have this one up so you can show more to get it? Um, I do if, not. If not, we'll put it, it in we'll the put bonus it, we'll, content. We will put it out in the bonus content, absolutely. It's a 68-page long document that kind of breaks down all this analytical information that they've put together. And on here, they have some open ports identified. Um, he, oh, you moved it. I did the wrong one. I'm new to this, so we'll see. There you go. So here are the ports over here on the left-hand side that show the quantity, the number of times seen in external scans. So port 443 and 80 are going to be like your web. Uh, HTTP and HTTPS, HTTPS yeah. yeah. So if you have a, a web server that is open to the public, which most likely you, you will have, those are the number one and two most commonly scanned ports. So you want to make sure that those are pretty locked down and not uh, just widely available to well, everyone with default username and password. And the other thing you probably want to do is take that web server that allows those ports and put it in the DMZ. A DMZ. And a DMZ stands for? Demilitarized zone. De demilitarized. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or sometimes referred to as a demarcation zone. Demarcation, yeah. But what, what it's used for is anything that comes into the DMZ is contained strictly to only allow traffic in and out of that DMZ. So it, it's not able to escape into your internal network. But it's still considered plugged in to the same location as your as your internal network would be located. Yeah. So it's not like it's a physically separate location or place where your web server sits. It's just plugged into a different port. location or port on your firewall. Um, and if you can utilize that option, I highly recommend it because it, if somebody were to compromise that web server, then they can no longer pivot outside of that web server into your internal okay, network. Okay, using the word pivot. pivot. What's that? Uh, the word pivot in the security world is known as uh, a method used to gain access to other machines on an internal network. So you get one compromised machine, you use that one. To pivot, if you will, to other machines on the network using either stolen credentials, uh, vulnerable applications on your network, um, any other means. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's thousands of ways to do it, but, but that's that's the idea behind the word pivot. Has anyone, anyone ever gone like, nerd alert, nerd, you, nerd alert, when you're talking about security? All the time. Okay. All well, the then time. you're doing it right, Good. apparently. Good. Do we have any questions? Dear Lex and Alex, aside from Windows updates, are there any other creative ways you guys use PDQ Deploy or inventory to secure your network? Thanks, Joseph C. Hey, Joseph. Um, creative I would, ways. Creative ways. Uh, you know, I started looking this up last night because I thought, you know, this might be a good thing, and, and it's a great question. Is there a WMI scan? I'm looking at Colby because maybe you might know one of these for open ports on machines. So I'm going to run a WMI scan that would set, show these are the ports that are open on this machine. In uh, inventory. I don't know any off the top of my head, but okay. uh, probably. Probably. So you could do a WMI scan, I would imagine. Um, I mean, you can look for GPOs for, I mean, obviously we got the GPO on my WMI scan. I think it's out on the net in one of our uh, KBs to scan for applied GPO so you can check for your password policy and those kind of things. And right. then I've, I've, got, I've got queries that I've run just to every now and then just do a checkup and make sure that there's no unauthorized Windows shares, so, there's no yeah. unauthorized accounts yep. in the Absolutely. local administrator uh, group, whether it's a local account or whether it's a, you know, an unauthorized domain account. Um, yeah, well, so it, it, it mostly comes down to, you know, to reporting we're not security software uh, necessarily, um, but the, just just the the PDQ inventory is gives you the ability to, to see quite a bit of yeah. your network and uh, quite a bit of the systems and the gaping the gaping wounds that can lie therein. But uh, when you find certain security software uh, that you like, the, most of the time you can deploy it with PDQ deploy. Right. So it goes hand in hand. But yeah, well, I find I find too sometimes you can find misconfigured things on your network with inventory and or you know inventory like in like like 
a share that's all of a sudden open to everyone without any password restrictions. That yeah. is absolutely one, one of the many ways that attackers get in is a misconfigured system. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to, to kind of drill down into one specific topic, but if, uh, if there's... Totally okay. okay, so let me run this by you. Go for so it. So we look, we find a misconfigured share, we find some software we didn't see before. You find this. Yep. What tools do you like to use to check? I mean, I know externally you can pay someone to do a... Vulnerability scan. Vulnerability, I like to call them port scans, but vulnerability scan. And I would suggest you do that. Have a company that specializes do that, but internally to keep your stuff safe. Again, you need to keep the inside of the chicken coop safe, right? So you just popped up ZenMap. ZenMap, if you haven't heard of it before, it is a free tool that does port scanning on your internal network. It's meant to run internally, not externally. Um, and I think will actually deny you running externally. But mm -hmm. what happens is, is it will run through, you can point it at a single target or multiple targets on your network. And we just grab bird person, so you'll notice right here, I put bird persons, um, you're not, you can't read that, but squint, get close to your screen, you'll be able to <laughs> see it's, it's bird person, all right? We put that IP in. But you can see here that it's discovered these open ports on this machine, which tells you if there are... No, no, uh, my bad. Two of us touching the keyboard at the yep. same time. Uh, host. Uh, oh, I guess it's still, it's still running. So, it's still Oh, and I run the intense scan. That's why. Yeah, I should have ran a quick scan. Let me just uh, change that real quick. But, but go ahead. Their, their documentation is, is quite in-depth. Uh, in but mm -hmm. here, yeah. you can, here you go. Here's a better... This scan runs quick. The other one, it'll do an intense scan and it run takes a bunch a you, of tests. Yeah, you but, can yeah. do some pretty lengthy stuff here, but... There you go. If I go over to the ports and host, you can see these are the open ports. Uh, Alex, what's 49, 153, and 154? I'm not going to tell you. Because then I would know and exploit would, them. Yeah, Okay. I don't want to tell you. But at least we know now that they're there, and we can go, if we wanted to close those, go close those. But you'll notice 3389. I always thought uh, remote desktop was uh, one of the highest exploited ports out there. It can be. Can be, but this is internal. So but as long as we internal. keep the fox out of the chicken coop, it's okay. Sort of. Kind of. No. So there's also, I mean, there's settings you can okay. tweak within RDP, but yes. So we got Zen Map. What other tools do you like? So what other tools I like are, um, and a lot of this, a lot of these links will be in the bonus content if yeah. you're not familiar with where to find these. Is Wireshark. Uh, Wireshark's a, a great free tool that you can use to view all of the active network connections within your network. Okay, the, the main thing I find this useful for is you can start seeing if someone's sending passwords or some application yeah. is sending unencrypted like plain text passwords across the network. Colby, you have any thoughts on Wireshark, buddy? Um, other than just re reiterating that it's great. I, I love it, I use it all the time. It it does take a little while to kind of figure it out, but once it clicks, then it's, it's an yeah. awesome tool. It's a great tool, yeah. Now this one's gotta be one of my favorites. <laughs> Burp. Burp Sweet. And we were discussing this yesterday. It should be called Belch. Belch but, um, Sweet is not a thing, but it Burp Sweet is. And what Burp Sweet's purpose is to validate and test a web application for vulnerabilities. Uh, it's, a, it's a great tool. The free what vulnerabilities? I, mean, I know. SQL so like injection. Cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting. Uh, there's reflection attacks. Um, did you say SQL injection SQL already? injection, that's my favorite. Yeah, I love that. SQL injection attacks. Yeah. Um, there's some um, again yeah, these there's... these are free and they do have paid editions but the free ones are awesome um, so give it a try it works great I mean Alex knows way more about it than I <laughs> ever would want to know but now um, all these will run in your Windows environment so no need to worry if they have a version that's before we move to the next one we got a question we do. We have a question from a new webcast viewer so welcome very uh, very very much welcome 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 uh, this might have something to do with TFS. If companies have offices in different countries, what do you suggest for patch management through PDQ? How can machines pull updates fast in different countries through PDQ? Sincerely, Gagan D, and I apologize if I mispronounce the name. Big dog. Okay, so this is what I would do. If you are managing in different countries, if you're trying to manage from one site to manage everybody, I would definitely set up DFS so that you're replicating so, uh, you know, replicating your packages so that you don't have to, you know, when you deploy Chrome, you don't have to deploy 50 times across <laughs> the WAN. It yeah. just, it goes and pulls it locally. Yep. There is 
videos on how to set that up. You just search for DFS on videos. That will help you. Um, the other thing you can do is have you know individual installs at each of those places so that you know you just download locally and take care of things. The nice thing is you can export schedules, you can export packages, you can export collections, and so you can get all that distributed if you are doing it in a more distributed nature like that. Any thoughts, Alex, Shane, Colby? Uh, Gagan, I would definitely su suggest looking at those DFS videos um, that, that Lex made. That, that seems to be uh, right, that seems to be exactly what you need. Yeah. And we work really, really well with DFS. Obviously, DFS comes down to uh, synchronization. You got to make sure that, that you're synchronized, especially when you're talking about, you know, um, patching, doing Windows patches yeah. that, that, are, that are large. But if you get that set up properly, um, then it, it, as long as you have a decent network, you will save uh, bandwidth, you will save deployment time. And if if you're running into problems, by all means, reach out to our support site because, uh, you know, we'd love we'd love to be able to help you maximize that. Absolutely. And thanks for the question, Gagan. Yeah, no, I don't have anything to add. I think that was great. Cool. Now, you know, here's one that we use often, okay? We get emails in with attachments. Where do you go check those? I will tell you. Because, you know, sometimes, you know, when I get that one that opens this attachment and you win an iPod, where, oh or an where? iPad or whatever. <laughs> I won something that starts with the letter I. It's like Alex's Xbox. Yeah, Alex's Xbox. I can go find out. It's, uh, uh, yeah. It we is called hybrid analysis. Sorry. Hybrid analysis. There we go. So what this is, is it's an online tool for free for people to use that you can plug in a, an attachment. So let's say you get in a PDF file or an Excel file or whatever it might be, and you don't want to open it because you're not sure if it contains some malicious code that might run in the background. I go to hybrid analysis here, uh, upload the file in where it says the you can choose three different options. Um, you've got a file, you've got online file or a URL you can validate and what happens is it will run it on a, a sandbox virtual environment. Uh, if I lost you there then we can talk just, about just do it, it. anyway. Just, just it's, do, it. do it. It's, it's fine. It's better, but yeah. Um, and then what it does is it spits a report back out saying if it found anything malicious or not. And this is another step that you can utilize in your arsenal of tools to make sure you're not downloading and running malicious files such as uh, my your good, I won the your good iPad. Friend. But um, yeah. no, my good friend, yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, so here's a, here's where the your your end user education comes in, guys. You know, yeah. everyone says don't open stuff you don't know, right? So, oh, just closed it. You just closed it. Anyway, so, if you educate people, is like, look, if it looks weird at all, just send it and do. You know, make sure you just do a quick check on it so they're not waiting on you. And uh, that's a good way to do it. Another place that you can go to help train your internal employees is um, CoFence. They have a tool called FishMe um, Internal Fishing. Testing. So what it will do is it will send uh, phishing emails to your internal users, acting as though it was looking legitimate, but it's actually a malicious um, a attempt at getting more information from you or your company. And uh, it's a great tool to use. I'd, to I'd test your end users? To is test all of your end users' knowledge on whether or not yeah. you should click something or so not. You're gonna and it gives, you a report. it gives you a report back. It's really cool. You should check it out. Check it out. Fish your own end users. With yeah, <laughs> go fence. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's, a, it's a good way for it, seriously to find out if you need to educate your end users, and, and everybody does. I agree. It's just a matter of how much you need to educate them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hey, know why that's funny. Don't look at me and laugh. Wait, let's have a question. Dear Lex, Alex, and Colby, is there a way to make collections based on AD user groups? If not, how would you best make collections based on users and not computers? Best regards and thanks for a great cast. Sincerely, Casper S. So, thank you, Casper. I'm gonna divert. To computers further Lex. and user groups. So, computers. Let's go. We'll look at our Windows 10. New dynamic collection. Computer name contains. I don't know. We'll just computer name contains the word win. No, that's not gonna work. Oh, it might work. Rick. Uh, Windows 10 machines. We'll run this and find out. So just type that up there. It's 80. All right. We'll run it. 
we'll see if I actually, I might have to open that up. <laughs> there we go, Rick, thanks. All right, so, and then the other thing we're gonna wanna do is add part of center. It, I love how, thank you, JJ, <laughs> I just start working. So, member of AD group. Member of AD group, name contains win. There we go. And okay, so you go after your Windows groups that way in your AD and apparently it's updating. That it's updating. It's updating. Is it? Let's go find out if there are anybody in here. Nobody has the name Rick in there, That's so why. we'll change it to the word lab. lab. So again, it's good to know what you're looking for when you do this. So, and then so you, you go after a filter on your AD, you go after a filter on, you know, your computer names and apparently I didn't do that right either but Colby this I, I don't believe we pull uh, users don't only, pull users only computers and uh, what you were mm -hmm. looking at up there was a an OU an OU my bad oh, right and not a group so again you want to check with Colby <laughs> this is why Colby, Colby works here so can you pop one up real quick here you want to come up and do this uh, I, I don't think we can. We don't, don't, I don't. I don't think we pull the information that they're they're looking that, for. That he's now. looking for. We can't. But you can, you can do it off OUs at this. Yeah. Point. Okay. Uh, inventory is computer based. Okay. Uh, generally, if you want to associate a a user to a computer, mm -hmm. uh, the closest thing we have is like the uh, the current user. Current user. Uh, you can create a custom field, uh, stuff like that. Well, there you go. I have been corrected live. I love that. Thanks, Colby. We got any other questions? Dear Lex and Alex, what's the best way to scan servers on our DMZ with inventory which sits on our internal network? Do we have to open up a connection on the firewall or is there another way? Thanks, Colton A. If there's, yeah, thanks, Colton. Um, the best way I can think to do something like that is to allow a one way connection from your internal to your DMZ, but you never want anything from the DMZ coming back to basically initiate a connection from the DMZ to your internal network. So if there's if there's some settings in there, some ports, you can add that say allow from the the LAN to DMZ from these IP addresses that whatever's running your, your inventory machine, if you can allow that into the DMZ but deny anything initiating from the DMZ back to the LAN. And it looks like Lex has pulled Here up. Here we go. A, so a if you go and you, you Google um, PDQ firewall ports and you pull up uh, the first thing that comes up, which is this, here are the ports that we use. Okay. So you would need a one-way connection, like Alex said, yep. from your internal to that machine to go pull this in. Can I, can I throw a little nugget in here? Absolutely. Since, since, since uh, I think it was mentioned DMZ, and if you don't want to open those ports, then uh, agent. Agent, yeah. The agent is also a that's right. That, that's great new tool that we have. Hey, yeah, you, you two should get. A, you, you two should get a, a be up to. You guys should. Someone introduce Lex to uh, PDQ inventory <laughs> and the new agent. <laughs> Show him how to do collections Alex, Alex, and you get what a we pass. actually. I get a pass. You're, you're, you're too worried about security all the time. <laughs> it's like it's like that Spider-Man Family Guy. Everybody gets one. Everybody that's gets right. One. Okay. The agent is probably what you're looking agent for is, in that yeah, case. And that would at definitely that be more point, secure. Remember, it's an agent will be considered external um, if it cannot reach the, the the server. So if it can't reach the server, if you have those ports that Lex had just called out, if you have those ports um, you know, disabled, at least from the DMZ point of view, it will be considered an external, even if it's just in the next room, an external agent, and it will do everything through... Uh, through our, through our cloud services. That's a very good point. Good point. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Sh sure, let's do another question. Another question? Yeah. Dear Lex and Alex, after patching administrative permissions and Windows firewalls, what's your best way of protecting against internal semi-trusted users? Thanks, William Z. Unplug their computers. <laughs> <laughs> Take away their keyboards. <laughs> I love that semi-trusted. <laughs> semi-trusted users. The so best way to, wow. I would say, that's just me talking. Okay. Talking about Since I'm talking I'm out of my mouth, right? <laughs> uh, I would say have a good antivirus solution. Absolutely. Because 
a lot of times it comes down to you only need one weak link in the chain to create a problem for everyone. And I like that. The other thing I do, do aggressive scans, your inventory scans and reports on their machine so you see what's happening on yep. a regular basis because you know, I compare a machine today to what it might be this afternoon. That's fairly aggressive. And you can start seeing what's going on. Yeah. And then obviously you can, you can say, hey, what, what are you guys downloading that you feel are you, you doing need this? Yeah. without asking permission or getting approval? How would that conversation go with your significant other? I hmm. semi-trust you. <laughs> <laughs> Dear, I've noticed you've been going to certain sites. <laughs> Here's a semi-trusted browser. <laughs> I'm going to have a semi-trusted <laughs> relationship. <laughs> Imagine if that were like SSL certificates. Like, I semi-trust this cert. Kind of. Kind of. Maybe. Today, maybe. Tomorrow, I might change my mind. Do we, have, do we have another question? Dear Lex and Alex, I sync my PDQ inventory to AD and have it in mixed sync mode to allow me the ability to manually create entries for laptops that are not part of the domain. Can a collection be made to show these entries not synced with AD? Thanks, Jeff W. Absolutely. All right. This time, no one will have to correct me. There might be a better way to do it, but <laughs> I won't have to be corrected this time. Added from, you add that guy in there. I'm just going to add that and fixed you'll see this is if these have all been added from AD sync so if I go and add a computer let's add a computer by name let's call it underscore a so it pops up right at the top that's our new computer we added it's gonna check for it in DNS obviously not find it but I'm still gonna add it there it is you'll now see it's manually added so what you'll do is you'll do a scan and look for computers that are added from anything other than AD sync Lex not a correction but will you show how you pulled up the collection window, or the collection, the, the the basically preferences to show how you can cho choose those collection columns. Ah, okay. So right here in the corner, I'm going to hover and I'm going to try and do a highlighter, which I broke earlier today trying to do a collection. So right here in the corner, if you click on this guy, this custom grid, is that where we're, you were headed, Shane? You want me to bring this up again? Yeah, yeah. Okay. By the time we zoomed in, you had already had oh, the window opened. I was on it fast and going. So yeah. <laughs> All right. That's where you can add columns, and you'll notice here I did added from, and I put it in fix, so it moves it right to the front. But obviously, you can move these guys around, so that's how you would do it. Thank you for reeling me back in there, Shane. Do we have any other questions? And our final question of the day. Did you guys decide to do this network security presentation to further separate yourselves from the PDQ chicken security breach? Thanks, Matt Z. Now, I'm going to take this one. I wasn't going to bring this up, but thank you. I'm, I'm going to bring, I'm, okay, there are many companies out there, much larger than us, that have been exploited. You've all heard of Target, Home Depot. Guys, if it happens to them, it can happen to you, and it's just important that we all jump on and have a very hygiene. <laughs> yeah, smell the freshness. Smell but the freshness. To, but to answer the question, yes. and yes, uh, to answer the question, um, no, we actually no. had this one chambered. Uh, a few Three weeks, weeks ago. ago. Yes, it was um, so th weeks this ago. is actually one of those where the timing is kind of fortuitous. <laughs> but thank you for asking. Because yes, we, we we've been waiting. We were actually kind of waiting for people to respond to us really, really hectically. Like, oh my gosh, have I been compromised? But we, you know, we prepared. We prepared a statement and everything. But as far as I know, we haven't had to. Yeah, I don't think anyone's ever had to assuage anybody. Yeah, that this is, is the not, first real question I've seen. From I was going to say, let me add, let me add something okay. to that as well that some people may not understand that. Um, there's a quote by, I don't, now I'm not going to know who, I don't remember, obviously. I love that Lex almost just spit out his drink. But <laughs> it, quote when, it, when, it com <laughs> when it comes to security uh, and being hacked, if you will, it's not necessarily a matter of if, but it's a matter a of win. when. So you need to protect yourselves always to whatever. your exposure. Yes. And it's not necessarily if you're a target per se. Now, I don't mean the company target. I mean like if someone's saying, hey, I want to go after this company here. Sometimes it's just there was a misconfiguration in one of the web servers and now port 22 is wide open with no password. Guess what? Someone's going to find that and you weren't even a target. You just now happen to be the lowest hanging fruit on the tree. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, at any rate, remember, hygiene's good, especially when you're in IT. I, on your network security, guys, network security, it's important stuff, guys. It really is. Um, 
Thank you for watching. Remember, if you're an awesome C Sharp developer, give us uh, a call. Give us a call. Apply. We'd love to have you guys along. So thanks for watching. I'm Thank Lex. You. I'm Lex. I'm Lex. I'm Alex. <laughs> See you all later. Thanks for joining our webcast today. Congratulations, Colton A. and Kyle B. Winners of PDQ Swag. Just send us your info at webcast at pdq.com. Thanks again for joining us. We will be off next week, so we'll see you in a couple of weeks.